Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm Steve Morrison from CSIS. Uh, we're thrilled to be here today with Sir Richard Branson and Dr. Michelle Kazakshin to talk about the major new report that was released this week, Taking Control Pathways to, to uh, Drug Policies That Work. Um, I'm going to offer a few opening remarks and, um, and introduce our two speakers, and then we will uh, hear from each of them um, uh, in sequence, and then we'll have a conversation, and we'll invite you uh, in the course of the program to uh, offer your own comments and questions. We'll have folks here in the audience that, uh, uh, from our staff who, uh, who can bring microphones to you. I want to offer special thanks to a number of folks here and, and, and with uh, Virgin and, and with um, the Global Commission who have been very helpful in pulling all of this together. Uh, Sahil Angelo, uh, Joe Jordan, uh, Beverly Kirk, Carolyn Schroet from CSIS, um, Khalid Tanasti uh, from the Commission, Helen Clark uh, from uh, Virgin Group. Um, we're very honored to be able to pull this together. Um, today is, of course, the 13th anniversary of 9-11, and it's a day, a special day here in America, obviously a day of remembrance and reflection, uh, and there are many events happening here in town around that. Uh, reminding us of the uh, cruel violence, the 3,000 innocent victims and their families, and reminding us that we operate in a very dangerous world, and, and we continue actively to debate what to do about that. Last night, we had the president's address, what to do to combat the Islamic State, how to define, understand, and rally the American people. Um, at the end of August, um, uh, I had the chance to visit the Flight 93 National Memorial in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, uh, where 44 Americans died. Um, it was haunting. It was a beautiful sight. Today is the dedication of the Congressional Medal of Honor for the victims to those passengers who died. Uh, former Speaker uh, of the House, Dennis Hastert, will be um, uh, presiding. I just want to offer our congratulations and thoughts and condolences on this, um, on this poignant day. Why are we here today? Um, we're here to, to talk about this newly released uh, report. Uh, it was released just two days ago in New York City, uh, uh, and we'll hear from Michelle and from, uh, and from Richard about uh, what happened in New York and what they see going forward. Um, at its core, uh, this effort this is a culmination of several reports that the commission was formed in 2011, put out a major initial report, which is a critique of the war on drugs, put out a second report uh, talking about HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis C, and this is the, the third major report. It's looking towards the 2016 UN special session uh, on drug policy. It's trying to shape that debate. And it takes things many steps forward. And we'll hear about that in terms of the debate. It's pushing for decriminalization, for regulation, for a strategic refocus of efforts to control, disrupt, interdict, uh, interdict uh, drug trade. It's a quite one, one of the things that's very striking about this commission is the uh, impressive array of statesmen and stateswomen that are assembled uh, uh, within the commission and standing by it and, and, and contributing to it. President Cardozo, former Brazilian President Cardozo, chairs the effort. And there are six other former heads of states, all, heads of state almost all Latin American. Uh, there's, of course, the pre former president of Switzerland along with former heads of state of Mexico, Colombia, uh, Portugal is, is included. Kofi Annan, former UN Secretary General, uh, former Secretary of State George Schultz, Federal Reserve Head Paul Volcker, Louise Arbor, former head of the UN Human Rights Commission. This is a very serious and, and impressive assembly of folks. It certainly uh, uh, forces us to sit up and listen and think hard about what's in there. The product itself will be distributing the report uh, to all of you here. I apologize, we didn't have it ready for you as you walk through the door, but we have it ready for you now. Um, and uh, it, it drew uh, very impressive press attention, 400 press stories, uh, 10,000 people joined the launch in New York City on Tuesday remotely, uh, and 50,000 tweets um, uh, on this. So clearly there's a, there's a very strong market for hearing about these uh, ideas and for debating uh, what, is, uh, what is the way forward, and I, my congratulations 
uh, to uh, Michelle, to Richard, and to the other commissioners for this uh, very successful launch, which has occurred in the midst of a co very crowded geopolitical field when you look at all of the other crises that are there. Let me just say a few words about the two commissioners we'll be hearing from. Sir Richard Branson, uh, a member of the commission, and also through Virgin United, Unite, through his philanthropic uh, organization, one of the supporters, one of the four or five key supporters of this effort. Um, he is known, uh, of course, for b uh, founding the, multi, um, uh, the multinational conglomerate Virgin Group and being an, uh, a, uh, a transformative entrepreneur in multiple sectors, uh, music, aviation, uh, mobile phones, banking, uh, radio, uh, and space flight. Um, he's also, in this phase, he's, he's, he's upped his game in terms of philanthropy and social justice. Uh, he's quoted often as saying, with wealth comes enormous responsibility. He's given a high priority to the war on drugs and given a lot of time to, to this particular commission and to this particular effort. So, Sir Richard, thank you so much for being with us. I also want to mention that I was reading that you um, will be uh, the grandfather of three children this year. Congratulations on that. That's, it's a big year coming up <laughs> in 2015. Uh, Dr. Michelle Kazakchin is a longstanding friend, personal friend, longstanding friend of CSIS, and an extremely distinguished global health leader. Uh, and he has been arguably the intellectual architect of what you have in this report. Um, he is currently the special envoy for the UN Secretary General on HIV AIDS in Central uh, Asia and Eastern Europe. Um, he's used his diplomatic savvy and experience and his the un unrivaled depth on HIV AIDS issues and his familiarity with these regions to, be in a very patient and persistent way, continue to try and, and, pl and, and move things forward in arguably one of the most difficult and challenging regions uh, of the world when it comes to HIV AIDS and, and treatment therapies and access. Uh, he led the Global Fund 2007 to 2012. He was President Chirac's envoy on global communicable diseases. Uh, he headed the French Agency on, on uh, AIDS research. Uh, just a remarkable career. Um, we'll hear from each in a moment about the commission. Um, I want to just say as a, as a point of background, in March, we brought together um, Michelle. We brought together uh, Ruth Dreyfus, the former Swiss head of state, former Swiss Minister of Social Affairs, and one of the, one of the um, uh, commissioners, uh, to hear about the commission's work. And we were joined at that time by Assistant Secretary William Brownfield, uh, from the, uh, the he Assistant Secretary Head of the Bureau of International Narcotics and, and, and Law, INL. We were joined also by Kevin Samet, formerly of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. There was a spirited debate then, and I thought it was a, a, very, successful, a very successful session. It demonstrated that there is much underway right now in terms of ferment and debate around these issues, and it is important to have these kinds of debates. Uh, and, and we're very proud and very um, honored that we can uh, play this role, play this convening role here at CSIS of having this type of debate. I was struck during that earlier session by a couple of things. The broad space that exists for pragmatic action in multiple countries. There's a considerable potential for bringing convergence and consensus around key areas for addiction, treatment of addiction, for reduction of incarceration, flexibility in decriminalizing areas like marijuana, safe access to opiates, uh, and intensifying and concentrating and refocusing the war on drugs. There is a tough debate that's going on around where do you draw the lines and what are the, what are the goals looking to 2016? And we'll say more about that as we, as we get here, as we hear from our, our commissioners. So let me just say we're very proud, again, to be here. There's, the debate is a very, very important historical and international global debate. We will stay active in this. We will welcome the commission back as its work evolves. So Michelle, why don't you start off with some opening remarks. Tell us the story. We'll turn to Richard, and then we'll have a discussion and invite our audience. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Steve, for that introduction. Um, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be back at CSIS, and it's great to be here with Richard to uh, speak on behalf of the Global Commission. 
Um, as, as Steve just said, uh, since our first report, the Commission's first report in 2011, we have been consistently saying that the international drug control system has failed uh, in its primary objectives. And, and please remember those objectives uh, that, that were discussed with the um, negotiations around the treaty 60 years ago. First objective was to reduce the negative effects and the health effects, particularly, of drugs. And the second was to make essential medicines and opiates for pain accessible to people. So we have been consistently saying that the system has failed to deliver on these objectives, to deliver on its own terms. And we have been calling for change and for reform. We've also been saying that not, not only has the system failed on its own terms, but it has actually generated harm. Prohibition has generated harms, health-related harms, HIV, the spread of HIV AIDS among people who inject drugs, the spread of hepatitis C, somewhere TB as well, deaths from overdoses. It has generated, it has undermined human rights and it has generated violations and abuse in terms of human rights all over the world. It has been fostering crime and allowed a, a huge uh, criminal industry uh, to grow a, a hundred billion business. It has undermined development uh, in a number of settings and it has basically wasted uh, billions of dollars that could have been spent in, in more intelligently. So um, three years ago, we have called for an open and frank evidence-based debate on these issues. Um, we, we called it break the taboo. Um, fortunately, somehow, or if you just look back, a lot of things have been happening in the last three years. And, and I must say we were quite pleased to see uh, not only that a genuine debate has started in, uh, and is underway in many parts of the world, but also that uh, in a number of settings and countries and, and in the US, in at least two states now, um, we've been moving from theory and rhetoric to, to practice, to action and, and reforms. Um, in this particular report, which um, we would like to uh, be our sort of uh, founding report as the debate broadens and takes us into to the perspective of the 2016 UNGAS, uh, we come with recommendations. Um, and we come with uh, five sets of recommendations. We call them five pathways to reform for healthier uh, drug policies. And um, please do, do look at those uh, as, as, you, as you receive the report. So I'll just summarize these recommendations now uh, briefly for you. There are two recommendations on health. The first one is very straightforward. It is prioritize health and community safety when designing or implementing a drug policy. Now, this is not, in our view, so it means, yes, that drugs is about health, not about policing, to make it clear. Um, and this is not just a general statement. Uh, it has profound implications. Of course, it means that policies should shift from the current emphasis on repression um, and, and prohibition law enforcement on to promoting health and safety of communities. But practically, it means shifting resources, reallocating resources from where they're going now into ineffective law enforcement to actually health and social interventions that we know from evidence work. It also has another implication that I'd like to draw your attention to because I personally think we we, we do not talk enough about it, which is change the indicators. Stop measuring the success of a policy on the uh, 
amount of, of crop eradicated, on the amount of this or that product seized, on the number of people arrested, uh, prosecuted, and incarcerated, and do measure the success of a policy on how much overdose deaths have been reduced, how much impact we had on the AIDS epidemic, on the hepatitis epidemic, how much have we been able to reduce crime, violence, uh, corruption, human rights violations, and, and improve the safety of, of, of communities. So change the, the indicators. And finally, of course, that recommendation on health also implies that we invest into health interventions, and particularly into what we, in our technical language, but I'm sure you're all aware of that terminology, call harm reduction. And let's be clear to us in the Global Commission, and I don't want to be too technical here, but harm reduction is not only needle exchange, it's also opioid substitute therapy, it is also um, uh, assisted uh, injection, safe injection rooms for people, it's heroin, medical heroin treatment for people in need, and it's uh, prevention and treatment of overdoses. Um, the second recommendation on health is about access to opiates for pain uh, for all those uh, in need. Again, people tend to forget that that was one of the core goals of, of the conventions in the first place. Um, and when we talk about uh, access to essential medicines, uh, the commission would include, of course, opiates for pain, but I would also say methadone for opioid substitute therapy. Um, and as you know, um, in fact, these drugs, um, these for, for medical use, are, are not accessible for uh, basically unobtainable in 150 countries in the world. Uh, WHO estimates that somewhere around 5.5 billion people on Earth do not have access to um, opiates for, for the treatment of pain, uh, although uh, these medicines and methadone are on the list of essential medicines of WHO. So a strong call of the Commission for that uh, access. Now our third recommendation and I'm sure Richard will elaborate on this. This is something that is uh, dear to his heart and to our heart in the Commission, is decriminalization. Stop criminalization and incarceration of people who use drugs. Stop criminalization of use and possession. Uh, we have been stating uh, repeatedly in all our reports, and, and, and hopefully strongly enough in, in this last report that criminalization for the possession of drugs is just wasteful and, and actually counterproductive. I like to say that it is also to us a prerequisite to a genuinely um, health-oriented uh, drug policy uh, and to, to, to harm reduction. Um, we, there's, I, I think, undisputable evidence in the literature that um, criminalization actually drives people underground, away from services, that it is a high-risk factor for people to inject unsafely and therefore for acquiring HIV and hepatitis. Uh, criminalizations introduces uh, and basically lobbies somehow for stigmatization. Criminalizations also uh, brings political and, and societal and, and, and practical obstacles to implementing large-scale harm reduction interventions. And it ruins people's life. I mean, w with a criminal record, how will you go for a loan? How will you go for a job, for employment, for housing, whatever, uh, if, if, if that is with you with the, for the rest of your life. So, and in addition to that, um, it just brings nothing to society, uh, expect, except, of course, spending huge amounts of money on, on incarceration, which uh, I think the people in this country, uh, uh, where, where 
I think which represents 25% of all incarcerated people in the world, but 5% of the world's population, uh, I think people in this country are particularly sensitive to, to this aspect. So um, that's a strong recommendation of, of, uh, of this commission. And we are seeing movement. Uh, I understand that um, uh, Eric Holder has been calling for less incarcerations uh, here in, in the US, uh, in, in the uh, region where, where I focus my efforts now. Uh, I have seen recently quite dramatic changes, for example, in Georgia, which was also with the US one of the highest uh, incarcerating somehow countries in, in the world. Um, we're also saying, uh, and that's another recommendation, that of course law enforcement should, 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 should be more strategic. Currently, uh, it is really predominantly focusing on the sort of lowest down of, of, uh, of the drug supply chain, arresting small dealers, uh, mules, um, um, but, but actually the big fishes somehow escape the system and, and there is a need to really focus enforcement resources on the most disruptive, the most violent, the most problematic uh, elements of the trade. Uh, and together with a, a, a much more stronger international effort against money laundering and, and corruption. Um, and our, our last recommendation, I mean, our last recommendation, I'll come to it's about NGAS, but our last sort of conceptual recommendation. Um, and for those of you who've been following the work of the commission, this may be somehow uh, new, uh, is about um, introducing regulated markets uh, uh, for drugs. Um, and basically put back governments in control. And this is why the title of the report is, is, is Taking Control. It means uh, taking control from organized crime and give it to governments. And the way to do it is um, responsible legal regulation. And I'm careful about the wording here. Um, I wouldn't go for legalization, because legalization may be understood or wrongly understood as, oh, these guys in the commission, they want you know, ev every drug to be available free for any, everyone from one day to the next. No, we actually want a strictly regulated system. And I'll just uh, build on what Louise Arbor was saying in New York two days ago. She was saying, uh, I found it remarkable, that if we were, if, if, if we were to just forget the past 40 years, if we were today to meet and to design a system, a, a, an international drug control system, uh, as we know we are handling potentially dangerous food, uh, medicines, uh, tobacco, would we think of prohibition as, as, as the way to go? No. We would think of, of a sophisticated, regulated system uh, for governments. Uh, prohibition would be the, the last you know, hypothesis somehow on, on the table. Uh, how, how, just think of how we, we, we handle potentially dangerous substances and products uh, generally, uh, be it cars or anything. Um, it is through regulation. And regulation could, could actually help governments control everything along the, the line from production uh, to the product itself, its dosage, its quality, its potency, its price, uh, its packaging. It could be about vendors through licensing. It could be about marketing, branding, advertising. It would be about the outlets. It could be about access, restricting age of access, restricting licensed buyers, and, and, uh, and so on, or medical prescription. Uh, all, the, all of these, uh, there's a huge number of options there that, that can be used. And, uh, I think that's why we will follow with a lot of interest, of course, what's happening in, in, in Colorado, in Washington, 
in Uruguay, and also in New Zealand. Let me, uh, I, I keep talking about New Zealand I, because I'm, I'm quite fascinated with what's happening there. You may know that in New Zealand, the parliament has voted a, a bill by which um, amphetamine um, stimulants, like stimulants, ATS as, they call, as, as they're called, um, can now be regulated. That if, if you're producing one of those drugs, you can basically submit a dossier to the authorities, just as you would do um, with, with a medicine. And with documented adverse events, uh, with documented content of, of the drug. And if the dossier is somehow accepted, uh, there's even discussion about animal experimentation just for, as for a medicine, then it can be sold in adult shops to uh, people um, above the age of 50, 18 to a certain, up to a certain amount. So this is to me the, the very sort of thing that we, we need to, to move to because in New Zealand apparently people consuming will be more interested in using uh, stuff that they know what it contains rather than whatever comes to them on, on the streets. Um, we're conscious that talking about regulation is, is not an easy thing. There's no simple blueprint for regulation. Um, that will be done by, you know, at a different pace from one country to another. Uh, what substances will be regulated or not regulated will depend on governments and, and context. We're, we're coming here with a principle. And I'll just, you know, end by recalling the uh, discussion we had here at CSIS with Ruth Dreyfus in, in, in April or May and, and that uh, Steve mentioned, um, and he also mentioned in, in his remarks, uh, that the, the, the current system, the conventions, have what, what we call flexibilities. Yeah? So there's a lot that actually you can do within the conventions. So the position, uh, let me be clear, the position of the commission is that we encourage countries to use those flexibilities to experiment new pathways. I talked about New Zealand, Uruguay, Colorado, Washington. Experiment and then build an evidence base. Um, but somewhere we're saying that ultimately um, responsible legal regulation is not compatible with the current uh, international treaties and that they will have to be renegotiated and revisited. That it will maybe happen in 15 years, <laughs> in 2030, I don't know. But by any means, and I'll end on this, we wish 2016 to be the sort of turning point uh, where the world comes together at the UNGAS uh, and hopefully acknowledges the failure of the current system and really moves, um, and that will be through language in the final resolution, uh, moves uh, to, to change and, and to reform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Sir Richard? Um, well, uh, thanks, Michelle. Um, thank you very much for inviting us today. Um, I'll keep my remarks short because I always think it's better to get on to questions than answers. Um, I think the war on drugs has been going on for um, 40, maybe 50 years. Um, and I think it's quite easy to see the damage that that war um, has done to societies uh, everywhere. Um, in some countries, uh, even, 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 well, really quite fr frightening what the, what the damage has done to individuals. Um, it's done damage to drug users, it's done damage to their families, uh, it's done damage to their communities, and, um, and the Drug Commission believes it's time to support an alternative approach to the uh, prohibitionist uh, framework that has been in effect and been so ineffective for decades now. People who use drugs uh, in the Commission's view should be treated with compassion uh, rather than being criminalized. Um, and yet every day people around the world continue to suffer as a result of prohibitionist drug policies. Uh, in Russia, uh, repressive drug laws fuel the HIV epidemic 
and in Southeast Asia. People who use drugs can be forced into compulsory treatment, which often involves beatings and torture. Well, not so long ago, I was invited to speak at a TEDx event at Armwood State Prison in California, which houses more than 3,000 prisoners, many of these for nonviolent drug use. And I spoke to prisoners and our prison guards about the war on drugs and how true reform of our prison system depends also on how we address the issue of drug prohibition. As you said, the US is just 5% of the world's population, yet it has 25% of the global prison population. And, and that outstrips China and Iran. And much of this is driven by the imprisonment of low-level drug offenders, uh, often from poor black and Hispanic communities. Like many issues, drug policy reform should not uh, be seen in isolation. It has the potential to affect fundamental change in other areas like the penal system or in reducing the negative impact of policing on certain communities. If drug policy, which costs 100 billion annually, were my business, I would call it a failure and I would have shut it down long ago. We're wasting way too much money, way too many other precious resources on incarceration. When we could and we should be spending these resources on education, vocational training, re-entry, and in the case of drug users, on treatment and proper medical care. Let's also not forget the cost of the war on drugs. In the UK, for instance, the government's own figure estimate that annually somewhere between 1.5 and 2.5 billion pounds is spent on the enforcement of both drug supply and possession offenses. What's more, the UK has one of the highest GDP spends in Europe on drug law enforcement, yet has among the highest rates of drug use in Western Europe. Looking at this as a businessman, I say that's been a pretty bad investment. It's time to try a new model. There are alternatives. As a member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy, I've long advocated for the use of non-criminal sanctions for drug possession and for countries to consider regulating drugs to take the market out of the hands of criminals. Countries such as Portugal, the Czech Republic, some states in Australia have all implemented diversionary schemes away from the criminal justice system for possession of drugs. In these countries and states, drug use has not increased and individuals who are not criminalized have better outcomes in terms of employment, accommodation, relationships, and so on. And perhaps most importantly, they are less likely to come in contact with the criminal justice system, closing the revolving door of recidivism. In Uruguay and two US states, Colorado and Washington, cannabis has been regulated and is subject to varying quality, age, and access controls. These reforms should be applauded. Not only does it undermine organized crime, it reduces the number of people at risk of criminalization and therefore at risk of imprisonment. As I've said, drug policy reform is not just about drugs. It is about much wider societal issues that we should all be concerned about. In 2016, world leaders will meet for a global summit on drugs at the United Nations. We need our politicians to be brave, we need them to look at alternatives to the current repressive policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a few questions I'd like to open with and then we'll turn to the audience. Um, the first is really about how to market uh, this commission's report to an American public and to an American electorate and to officials in the United States. And when you look at what's happening in the United States, a couple things jump out. One is we are in a period of experimentation. We have the decriminalization and shift to regulation in Colorado and Washington State. Now, that is not without uncertainty and tensions surrounding that. It's, it's not in, in, in compliance with federal law. It's not in compliance with treaties, international treaties. And it's, uh, we're at an early point where people are, are looking at it critically around what are the health implications, what are the crime implications, what are the industrial implications, what kind of habits emerge out of this, how do you deal with children, how do you deal with driving, and other such things. So it's a big debate. I don't think that that yet, 
I don't think that that shift that has begun and, and has deep roots translates necessarily into uh, an openness around uh, decriminalizing heroin and cocaine use, which was some topic that was at the center of the rollouts discussions in New York. So um, the, other, the other point I want to make is there's a lot of discussion here in the United States ac across states and, and communities around the overuse and over, overuse of pain medications. And uh, we've had a situation where opiate access has been too much, not too little. Uh, and we've, uh, as a matter of policy, begun to uh, uh, take action. And we're seeing a sharp uptick in our own heroin epidemic here in the United States as a consequence of that. And we're struggling with that. In terms of the drug war, of course, we have longstanding programs uh, international agreements, uh, serious investments in Latin America, Afghanistan, increasingly West Africa. Uh, these are negotiated with Congress. They're negotiated with the partner governments. Uh, and they involve, as you've said, they've involved um, substitution crops, eradication, interdiction campaigns, destruction of product, and the like. And as Richard is arguing, they're, they're very, very controversial. Um, in Congress, of course, we have uh, a key, if you're talking about moving towards a treaty in 2016, tr sentiment towards an reopening the conventions and the treaty, that would require 67 votes in the Senate. And we haven't had very many treaties passed uh, in, in the last few decades um, in the Senate. So that's a practical political barrier that we have to look at. And the point that you were making, Richard, around, uh, I mean, Michelle, around what can we do now? What are the flexibilities within the new convention? So from a US standpoint, there's lots happening on the ground. Things are moving forward without waiting for a new convention or a change of law and the like. And there's a lot of opportunity. How do you connect to that? But also, you have the, the obvious barriers that I don't think there's, there's an openness to a critique of the war on drugs, but it, I don't see it as being abandoned or uh, it, it shut down, as you were suggesting. So which I see it being reformed, perhaps, or modified looking forward. Uh, and I, we have not had a debate in the United States around really legalizing cocaine and heroin uh, as the next step looking forward. We're at an early point um, on the marijuana. How do, you res how do you respond to that mix of factors when you think about trying to advance the commission's work and get it received and understood here in the United States? Because it's a it's a complicated and difficult um, environment. Richard, would you like to off open up? Um, well, first of all, I always find there's a danger that we always come back to America. And, and obviously, we, we, there's, a, there's a big world out there. And the Global, the Global Commission are trying to, you know, trying to stop people executing people for taking yes. drugs in some parts of the world. So, um, and I think a, a country like America should be setting an example to some of these other countries like Russia and. China and, and, and some of the much more oppressive countries. Um, uh, as a businessman, as I said in my talk, um, uh, if I find I've got a, a, a business that's, that's failing, um, I will immediately look at businesses around the world and see if anybody's doing it better. Yes. Um, and uh, and I mean, Portugal, I, I really do think it's worth just discussing in slightly more length. Um, Portugal had a massive heroin problem 12 years ago. Um, and it was uh, number two on the, uh, the most talked about subject in the political arena. Um, and a, a, a very smart prime minister of Portugal said, OK, we're going to try a completely different approach. We're going to, uh, we're going to say that uh, anybody who's, who takes drugs, um, any kind of drugs, um, they, they will be helped. They will not be put in prison. Uh, in order to try to get people who had heroin to come forward. And, um, and, uh, and what we'll do is we'll, the money that we, we're gonna, we'd, we would have spent sending them to prison, we'll spend on setting up um, centers around Portugal where they can go to get their clean needles, to get their methadone, and to get, get, their, um, to get their fix. But they have to see psychiatrists, and when they're ready to be weaned off, we'll help, we'll help wean them off. Um, which costs about a third of what prison would have, would have cost yeah. them. Um, and over the last 12 years, uh, the, 
uh, the breaking and enterings in Portugal have almost disappeared uh, because people don't need to break and enter because the state su supply the methadone. Uh, the spread of HIV and AIDS has, all, 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 you know, has gone away because they get clean needles. Um, the amount of people taking heroin has dropped dramatically, so um, those people are now useful members of society again. Um, uh, and, uh, and the problem has dropped from number two in the political arena to number 17 in the political arena. Yes. I mean, it's almost non-existent. Yes. Um, and the amount of money saved by the Portuguese government on prison, prison costs has, has, you know, has disappeared. So, um, so when you have, you know, when you have an example like that, you've got mm -hmm. to, you've got to get out and let the public, you know, let the public know about it. Um, the commission launched a film called Breaking the Taboo, um, and we, we, fo we, you know, we very much focused on the Portugal, Portuguese mm -hmm. thing. Um, we, we've got out there, um, you know, I mean, the, the, it had nearly a million people watching it on the internet. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, we've got to try to get out there and educate people and get, get people to realize that there are, you know, there are alternative ways to, to the current way which are much more effective. I think it's interesting that the commission enlisted two very prominent person American personalities who are economists to get back to your, yeah. your business model that Paul Volcker and George Shultz, of course, former Secretary of State, former Secretary of Treasury, um, that they were lending their names to this effort and their and their intellects and their and their reputations um, to this. Uh, that's a very important thing, um, Michelle. How do you see what what is the strategy for bringing this commission, connecting this commission to Americans in American yeah. debates? I agree with Richard. This is a global issue, and we need to be global in our outlook. But since we're a Washington-based think tank and we speak to an American audience. Uh, as the first order of business, I felt like the first or, first question needed to be about yeah, what's, of course, how do you wish, sell this to Americans? This I, audience I would, here is predominantly American. I wish that American. Paul Volcker, who actually uh, joined us on, on Monday uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, plenary uh, meeting of the commission, uh, uh, you know, could have been here uh, today to, um, and I think we Europeans, you know, feel a little unease to talk about the U.S. But let me say a few things. First, um, I, I, I fully support what Richard just said because our point is we need to build the evidence and we, we need to make the decisions and to uh, present to the public opinion the evidence. Uh, it's, it's a, and that will be very difficult. It will take a lot of time. Let's not you know, be irrealistic there. But let's stop having a debate that is exclusively built on preconceived ideas, on ideology, on evilization, if such a word exists, of, of, of drugs as, yes. as evil, you know. And, and uh, let's have a reasonable debate. Uh, I, I personally think, um, again, thinking of how we deal with, I shouldn't say arms in this country, but let's say, uh, a, a car safety, uh, tobacco, uh, medicines, um, alcohol, alcohol uh, with, with the failures and the successes yes. uh, uh, of in, um, worldwide and in this country. Alcohol, of course, is a key example. I mean, this is the country recognized the failure of prohibition. And, 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 the, and though it's going into prohibition on, on, on drugs instead of regulation. So, uh, I think that's a, a key angle. Build uh, um, an evidence base and, and then draw the parallel with the way society, the society and the American society handles potentially dangerous substances. Um, second thing, of course, is learn from experience. So experience outside the US. Uh, Richard mentioned Portugal, which mm -hmm. you know is a, a shining example to us. But also, basically, when it comes to harm reduction, all Western European countries where there's no more infection with HIV of any person who injects drugs, zero, problem solved. Um, uh, look at uh, the Czech Republic that has decriminalized. Look at Switzerland that has these safe injection rooms. And, and heroin, medical heroin assisted programs. Look at the success of Australia that really has contained to a minimum the AIDS epidemic. 
uh, by uh, you know, large-scale interventions from the beginning. Um, and um, look at Uruguay now, and of course Colorado states and Washington. I, I understand that Colorado and Washington are taking slightly different approaches, so the two experiments will be interesting to follow. There's uh, Colorado, we help us see the risks of over-commercialization somehow. Washington goes a bit more uh, regulated. Um, and then take the, the best of the models and, and, and learn the, the, the lessons too. Um, the, and, and of course you mentioned heroin and uh, uh, the, the commission is not coming with any, you know, we're not entering specific products here. We're saying this is the principle. We believe a responsible legal regulation is the way to go. Uh, and it will be up to the people and to governments to decide on which are the substances and when that they want to move to a regulated uh, market. Um, for the US, learning the lessons from inside and outside uh, means really uh, accepting and acknowledging these flexibilities in the conventions. Mm -hmm. And as you said, Colorado, what's happening in Colorado in Washington is against federal law and against the international conventions. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not. Well, no, I mean, uh, I, I mean, that's, I, I, that's a discussion know, about yeah, the but, flexibilities. But fortunately, fortunately there's, there's but somehow it can <laughs> squeeze in. But, yeah. but you know, um, safe injection rooms and, and medical heroin in Switzerland was also in that situation. So you have to discuss with, with the international community. But the, uh, what I meant is that the very fact that the US, the federal government, the administration here, has accepted this to go on means that they acknowledge the flexibilities. And, and I, I personally find this, this openness in mind remarkable. Uh, and that, that's the way to go. Learn, build the evidence base, and move towards reform based yeah. on the risk. I mean, in our, in our previous report, we, are, we, we said we wanted different states, different countries to experiment with different, different approaches. Yes. Um, the, the current approach uh, does not work. It, do, it does an enormous amount of harm. The more, the more experimentation, and, um, the better. And then we can, uh, we can see which systems work and, and, and which are not working, and, and then adopt, adopt the ones that work. Yes. Um, and, and in a sense, that's what's happening, which is, which is to be welcomed. Yes. I think it's important to mention here that um, the, the terminology and the way in which these problems are discussed uh, have changed here in Washington. I was listening to an interview by um, the acting head of the White House Office on National Drug Control, uh, Mr. Botticelli, uh, in NPR this week, um, emphasizing humane compassion emphasizing addi addressing addictive disorders in a new and different way. Um, there's, a, there, there's a consciousness, a change of consciousness. And this is a person who, who also himself is a freely admitting uh, recovered alcoholic uh, who personally has lived through this. So uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting period. Before we, I'm going to come to the audience in just a moment. I want to ask you both, what would success look like in spring of 2016 when you have the when, you, when the UN special session comes together, um, what, are the, what, what are you looking for as the real milestones? Because this is all, these steps have all been built and engineered in order to get the best outcome you wish to see in 2016. Given what you know of the politics, uh, Latin American, uh, African, Central Asian, North American, uh, European, uh, given the complexity of the issues, given what you heard this week in New York, what is likely to be, the, in your view, the best, what will success look like in 2016? I think I'll just have four words. More, more flexibility for experimentation is, is what's needed. Um, and and those, that's the key, I think. And, yeah. uh, Michel? I would say um, get to an, uh, an open, uh, debate uh, and an acknowledgement of the failure and the need for change. Uh, because, you know, 2016, th this is what the United Nations General Assembly has failed to do so far. If you look at the outcome of the 1998 right. session, the last summit, it said, okay, let's, uh, let's try harder on prohibition. 
and, and that's the way we will get to a drug-free world, you know. So uh, acknowledge the fact that a drug-free world is an irrealistic goal, acknowledge the failure of the current system, uh, and, and engage in a reform uh, system that would prioritize health based on the flexibilities. Of course, we're not saying, uh, uh, Steve, no misunderstanding here, that we would hope that um, the summit in 2016 will discuss renegotiation of the treaties. Mm -hmm. We're just saying that ultimately, again, um, legal regulation is not compatible with prohibition. I mean, that, that's... Uh, yes. Uh, um, yes. Um, at the core, it would seem to me, is Latin American leadership, right? The Latin American governments are very... The former heads are the dominant constituency within this. They, they are the countries that are most, most at the crossfire of all of these phenomenon that you're talking about. I would think that in 2016, if you see this commission give political cover to the leadership from Latin America to come and say things differently. When you were saying about greater flexibility, I would say if you see significant shifts happen in Latin America on liberalizing, regulating, and refocusing the war on drugs, the three things that you're arguing for in your report, that would be success, uh, a shift. Yeah. And using the commission to empower and cover and, 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 and galvanize that sort of movement, it seemed to me that's your, that's your greatest, mm -hmm. your well, greatest the, win. The audience is probably familiar with the OAS report yeah. uh, a year and a half ago. Um, but um, yes, I agree with you on moving Latin America is somewhere at the forefront. Yet, uh, good old Europe, you know, uh, has a number of, of good examples. And when it comes to prioritizing health and decriminalizing, I see movement elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I see movement in some of the um, countries east of the EU uh, and west of the Russian Federation. I see movement in Ukraine. I see movement mm -hmm. in Moldova. I see movement in Georgia. I see movement in West Africa, where Kofi Annan launched uh, this year uh, the report of the West African Commission in Indonesia. Um, and so, um, you know, prioritizing health and decriminalization can bring quite a, a broader consistent, a consistency, cons, constituency mm -hmm. than what we're um, Thank you. It's, it's, yeah. it's quite interesting that uh, in the Caribbean, I've spoken with a lot of uh, Caribbean leaders um, who want to uh, who want to make a move in the Caribbean, um, but are frightened that their citizens will be punished when they come to America by immigration or customs and so on. Um, obviously, what they're all looking at is what's happening in America. I mean, it, it once what I think that, I don't know how many states have now got medical marijuana. Um, but maybe 20, 22. 22. 22. I mean, it's quite, 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 quite a lot. Um, and once the pendulum starts swinging in that way, then you know America is going to lo lose its authority uh, to, I think, um, to to stop the other countries do, do, doing what they want to do. And um, and and I, I think it's the pendulum's getting to that stage where where I think other countries will just say, uh, if America can do it, well, we 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 can do it too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's take uh, three or four. We'll, we'll take four comments and questions. Please be very succinct. As long as you can remember them. <laughs> offer, I, will, I will play them back to you. Um, be very succinct. Offer one major intervention, please. Down in front here. Please introduce yourself, and then right behind, and then we'll, we'll take a collection here in the front, and then we'll move over. Yes, please. I'm Mitzi Wirth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School. As I listen to you, what I felt as a citizen, I wanted a consumer report. I wanted you to list all the countries and all the, th the conditions they're all in and have it accessible for all of us to learn. If one has to go and figure out the details, it's too hard. And secondly, if things are changing, you want to keep your consumer report information up to date. And I would call it learning from others. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just very, behind. Uh, just a very good idea, anyway. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Andrei Klepik of uh, International Achievements Alliance in Ukraine. My question is about uh, opponents. 
countries like Russia, which are not only exercising their repressive policy in Russian Federation, but with aggressive annexation of Crimea, actually uh, 80, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, 800 of uh, opioid substitution therapy patients were cut overnight from life-saving treatment, and 20 of them has died already. Uh, so, uh, this is an example how important emergency reaction should be on, uh, on, uh, on the countries with the most uh, dissonating policies. And my question is, uh, does the uh, Commission consider this task as, as its task, and is there any plan, say, f f action plan for 10 countries with the most dissonating policies? Thank you. Right out in front here, please. Take two more, and then we'll come back. Um, Dana Weckes, a Global Health Partnerships Consulting, Baltimore, Maryland. This question is directed to Sir Richard Branson. Um, other than your leadership and your representative of the corporate sector, are there other corporations taking the lead, not in terms of just advocacy, but in terms of HR policy um, f for a drug, um, drug control? And also, can you address uh, Ibogaine? I think it is called. It's a, it's a drug that's used to actually treat people who are addicts and it's successful, but yet it's illegal in the U.S. Okay. Right here in front, Sahil. Hi, uh, David Borden with StopTheDrugWar.org and the Drug War Chronicle newsletter. Uh, my question for any of the panelists has to do with the uh, ramifications of the treaties in their current form, assuming that it is going to take longer than the next two years to to get them changed. Uh, uh, what kind of constraining impact in practical terms is this likely to have on countries that might consider um, uh, legalization uh, or non-prohibitionist systems uh, uh, nationally, not just in individual states as, we, as we've had here? Uh, can we expect to see any more countries do as uh, Uruguay has done and uh, just go for it? Uh, should countries do that? Thank you. So we have a question around from Missy on how to stay up to date and try how to access how to. This is such a complex, global, fast-moving picture. How do you track that? On the Ukraine question, how much does that figure within the commission's can we do it, work? Can we do it one at a time? I mean, on, yeah. the, on, on the first point, I, I think it's, it, it makes a lot of sense, and I think the commission. Uh, I mean, the reports, yeah, you know, to, to an extent, touch on these issues, mm. but we need to be more thorough, precise. precise thank you. And, we're, we're, and we promise you we'll do better <laughs> and, and, um, and commit our team to, yeah, to work on that. It's, it's a very, very good idea. Um, on Ukraine, um, uh, I'm going to, going to Kiev tonight um, and, um, uh, and uh, we'll be meeting a lot, of, uh, a lot of business people over the next couple of days and, and you know, we'll, we'll definitely follow, follow up on that. And, um, and, uh, I don't know if there's anything more you can give us before I leave on that, um, but, but that would be great. Um, and then on the other Other point, corporations? Uh, the corporations. Oh, oh, corporations. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would say that pretty well every business, uh, where is, where's the first, sorry, where every business person I talk to, uh, um, uh, you know, believe pragmatically this is, you know, this is a sensible approach, and the, the current approach, it doesn't make sense. Um, and, um, and, um, and, I, and I do believe in, in, um, in this day and age that business people have got to speak out more and they shouldn't just leave it to um, you know, politicians and social, the social sector to do issues like this. They should actually uh, confront, confront issues like this and, and say what they think and, and not be afraid of saying what they think. Um, we've just set up something called the B Team with a group of business leaders like Paul Pullman from Unilever, Mohammed Yunus, Ariana Huffington, and so on, to um, you know to speak out on issues that, um, that that business leaders feel strongly about, and um, and I will do my best to try to get more you know more to rally rally behind it. Michelle, did you have anything to say? The question around how constraining is the is the current treaty going to be? Yeah, let, let me just uh, comment um, quickly on Ukraine and, yeah. and, and Russia because, well, first, as I said, um, the three countries that have recently signed an association agreement with the EU, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, happen to now move towards 
progressive reforms of drug policies. And, and they've actually started even before the, uh, uh, the uh, conflict in, in the region. Ukraine had passed uh, in 2013 um, uh, a, a, a very progressive framework for reform of drug policy. I'd like also to point out to the Baltic countries that together with Ukraine, you know, are experiencing an Eastern European or let's call it Russian type of AIDS epidemic with, with uh, uh, injecting drug use uh, being a predominant uh, factor for HIV transmission and the Baltic countries have moved towards large scale implementation of harm reduction and reforms. So I, I see a movement there, but Andre's question was really about what do we do with, the, with those who strongly oppose the sort of thing we say. Well, the answer is, uh, first, there, there is a lot of resistance from the Russian Federation, but also from many others in the UN. And there's, bar, at this time, uh, far more people who would oppose the sort of thing we are saying uh, in the UN uh, among the 193 countries of the UN than, than people who support this. But uh, as Steve and as we have been saying, you know, progressively things change. In three years' time, there's been a huge progress. And my answer is to your question is we, we just have to continue to try and establish a dialogue. I mean, the more there is uh, stated difference and opposition, the more and harder we should try to establish a dialogue. And at this time, it's almost impossible with the Russian Federation, but I'm not <coughs> hopeless. Let's continue and try. And I think if, if Richard, you can have the community of businessmen, you know, uh, uh, the Russian community of businessmen, or some of them engage, uh, I would try and, and I keep trying engaging the scientific and the medical community. Uh, and, and there are already networks of NGOs and there are blogs and there are various things. So let's create the movement and, and, and open the dialogue. I mean, in the same way that we've set up an African commission, I, I, I mean, I'm just thinking that, uh, thinking as we're talking that, we, you know, we don't, have, uh, we don't have Russian commissioners, we don't have Ukrainian commissioners um, uh, and, and, and other people from that area, you know, that area on, on the commission, whether we should set up another commission in, the, in you know, in, in, in there. Uh, you know, it may well be we should. So we'll have a think about that. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point because the, the, the very point about the African, West African Commission is that it is composed of West Africans. Yeah. And that, uh, you know, it's, these people are the best place to actually look at all the complexities of the context. We've, we've educated, you know, in the last three or four years, you know, I've learned enormous amount from being on the commissions. And, and so, you know, sometimes it's just lack of, uh, lack of facts and lack of, you know, lack of knowledge that mean that people have a particular yeah. viewpoint and we need, to, we need to get more people to get that viewpoint. On the uh, truth, I think your, your point is, is well taken, uh, David. Um, at, the, at this time, again, at this time, um, the, uh, Talking about legal regulation uh, of, of, of drugs is incompatible with the treaties. So um, the way to go forward is to, is to see how far the system will accept that experimentation, including legalization by some countries, will be accepted as a flexibility, uh, whether, uh, you know, uh, the treaties indeed have this as a flexibility or whether it is a sort of tolerance, doesn't matter. The important thing is that the number of countries move. Uh, Uruguay has moved and Uruguay has not been excluded, you know, at this time of the concert of the nations. So uh, that's a good example to me. Uh, Switzerland had issues with INCB when it decided on uh, safe injection rooms and, and medical heroin treatment. Switzerland has survived that and, and moved and remained firm on its decisions. So that's obviously the way to go. And America hasn't been thrown out yet. And America hasn't <laughs> been thrown out. Actually, I think America, of course, with its weight, is creating a fantastic precedent there. So uh, again, our message is we encourage that uh, to build the evidence uh, but then 
at one point, flexibility should, should, should move to, to changing the system. Let's take another round of questions and comments. I want to ask Richard Baum from the White House uh, National uh, uh, Office on National Drug Control Policy to offer any thoughts or comments. Thank uh, you, Richard, thank you. for joining uh, us. My pleasure. I have a question for Mr. Branson. And I wanted to ask in the Commission's uh, debate and dialogue about uh, what to focus your energy on, whether the commissioners are gr grappled with the consequences uh, is of trying to, in Mr. Cardoso's words, to break the conventions and go for such a dramatic change. Because m the bulk of the commission's report, the types of things you propose, alternatives to incarceration, addressing sentences, access to medications, addressing human rights violations, these are all things that uh, we're working on already in the U.S. government with our partners internationally that are all allowable under the conventions. And it seems like what we really all need to do, governments need to do, is look at our laws and look at our policies and make those changes. And for a lot of countries, including us, that's a lot of hard work that we need to really focus on and pay attention to. And I wonder whether calling for uh, uh, renegotiating the conventions, which is as you both have pointed out, a kind of distant and difficult and challenging task really gets people's eye off the ball because there's so much work to be done and, and, and maybe we ought to focus on getting that work done and making all these changes that are allowable under the convention and, and not let countries and governments get distracted on such a distant and unlikely goal. Thank you. I, I'm a, can I just quickly answer Please, that? please, let's go ahead. No, That's no, a very no, important um, question. Uh, uh, we'll get to you, sir, in just one moment. Yes. I, I, I mean, personally, I 100% agree with you, uh, which is why I slightly jumped in when you said that, you know, because I think the, uh, you know, I think there are ways around the, the uh, you know, w the way it's currently drafted, and, and, I, and I do think countries just need to get on and get on and, uh, and, and, and be brave and experiment, as, as actually is happening here in America. Um, so, um, so I think, yeah, I think we, we, you're, you're right. We, we do need to be careful not to get distracted, we, but we can, you know, we can do our best to try to change it. Um, it's going to be very tough. So I think, I think realistically, um, we, we need to just try to deal with individual countries. And uh, you put it very well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Michelle, did you have anything to add? No, I, again, I, I, I don't want, you know, people here to misunderstand the commission or, or think that uh, I think we're uh, very consistent. Uh, we, we need to use these flexibilities. You know, we need to push the flexibilities to their limit to, to move as much as possible. Because if we were to wait for a renegotiation of a treaty, nothing would happen. What I'm just saying and what the commission is saying in this report is that Ultimately, if we want to move to legal regulation of drugs, that's not compatible with the very basic prohibition paradigm. So we'll have to think of revisiting the treaty. We have a few more minutes, and then we're going to close. Um, Martin, did you have and this gentleman right here? I love the hat. Did you? Thank you. <laughs> I was going to say. Uh, Howard Woldridge, co-founder of LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. It has been the experience of my membership of police officers, judges, prosecutors, and others that the drug prohibition has been the most destructive, dysfunctional, and immoral policy, immoral policy since slavery and Jim Crow. My question is uh, what Steve said earlier about this is the anniversary of 9-11. Uh, on that day here in America, we had more FBI agents chasing drugs than terrorists. Now, they quickly switched many thousands over to anti-terrorism. But and the anniversary of 9-11 and just recently, of course, 7-7 in the UK, uh, I would like to just point out that every hour my profession spends chasing a drug user or drug dealer is an hour we don't have to chase terrorists who are trying to kill us. Moreover, we have been a mosquito on the butt of an elephant. We have never reduced availability in the history of the 43 years and a trillion dollars. So please, as you go forward with your discussions at the highest levels, please know that my profession has no role in this equation on, on drug use, drug availability. We simply make no difference. My question regarding that, uh, when you talk to folks around the world, how much does my profession fight you and resist the idea of changing the dynamic from a prohibition model to a legal regulated model because hundreds of thousands of jobs are on the line here in America. Uh, when you close half the prisons because you won't have those prisoners in there for drug reasons, 
guards will be laid off, et cetera. So how much resistance do you see from my profession uh, due to the money we're going to lose when we change our dynamic? Thank you. Let's take uh, two or three other questions. Martin, and then over here. Well, first, Steve, I want to thank you for this uh, really terrific forum. And Sir Richard, thank you so much for your concentration on these efforts. And Michelle, it's wonderful to hear you again on this important topic. So thank you very much. I'd like to really focus a bit on the challenges, uh, particularly of, of maintaining the appropriate resources for change and for helping the victims of, of drug use and, and it's particularly addiction. And you know, what, what ends up happening uh, in so many of these countries as, or in our states that are going to progressive change is that the money is being used for sort of global government purposes and debt reduction rather than really thinking about redirecting those funds and the savings to really de um, uh, building the infrastructure. I mean, for example, uh, I'm doing some work right now with colleagues in Prague, and, as well as in Georgia and Ukraine, where we're trying to put together educational programming for those who actually are going to be doing the work in the trenches. And it, the difficulty, of course, is coming up with sufficient resources to keep building the infrastructure. Uh, you know, most of the training is going back to the the sort of old approach to, to drug treatment, which is emphasizing the need to, for um, absolute prohibition, the, the need for um, sort of self-control, rather than really thinking about more progressive approaches to, to drug treatment. So uh, I just wanted to say that uh, if, if we're going to be progressive, we need to be mindful of building that infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, can, we, can we just do those two first? Sorry. Sure. Uh, <laughs> sure. Why didn't you do that? Uh, um, that yep. I, uh, thank you for your comment. You I, was know. Hope, I was hoping ah, you do, I right. you do the last one, I'll do the first. <laughs> so go for the first, and then I'll comment after uh, you. Okay. Because <laughs> okay. that was a more difficult one. Um, they, um, and put no, on the hat. Uh, anyway, you couldn't, you, you couldn't, you, obviously, you couldn't have put, put, uh, put the Drug Commission's words more, more clearly. And, um, and obviously, having somebody who's from law enforcement saying it is all, all, all the more powerful, because you've been out, out in the front line, you've seen the damage. Um, um, and um, uh, I, I mean, I think that generally speaking, when, w w you know, when you talk to uh, law enforcement officers one to one, they, they all believe the law is an ass and, 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 and they, uh, they, you know, they disagree with it. Um, uh, but there's, there's no question that um, there, there are organizations that lobby to keep the law in place that maybe you know, that run, run big prisons in America and make a lot of money out of it. And, and, um, but, you know, I think what we just need to get across is that, uh, you know, that, that, you know, you don't have to be, you, you know, you don't have to be a prison warden for the rest of your life. There are other, there are other jobs out there. And if, and if we can start, you know, closing down the, the prisons and maybe, you know, moving some of those jobs into drug rehabilitation, getting people well again, getting them back on the streets. I mean, you know, there's, plen there's plenty of alternative work now you know, being created, and, um, and it's certainly not a good reason to keep a, a archaic law in place which does so much damage. And I was going to say, I, I've been hearing about remarkable examples uh, of, of, of police, uh, uh, police officers and law enforcement officers actually moving into serving as uh, health promoting uh, agents. Uh, I've heard a lot about the Seattle program uh, and uh, at the uh, World AIDS conference last July in Melbourne, we had a, a, a session with police from Vietnam, from Nigeria, from Ghana, from the US uh, Seattle. Uh, and I understand there will be a conference in, in Amsterdam uh, in November or October exclusively devoted about how actually the police, uh, when it gets uh, to a person um, on the street, uh, that they would arrest for possession, consumption, carrying, depending on the context, how in fact they could serve as the agents to help bring that person to a health facility rather than arrest them and, and have them in jail. So we should also think about the police as, as, uh, as helping our goal of uh, promoting health and reducing harm, um, uh, which, which, um, which is another way of looking at what you're saying. 
Um, I, would, I would fully take your, your point. Uh, uh, there are huge efforts uh, in investments in infrastructure and education and training are needed. Uh, and, and these will be almost impossible or still extremely difficult while the, in some regions of the world, the paradigm of prohibition, as you said, is so strongly embedded. Uh, but so there are regions in Kyrgyzstan, for example, as you know, there is a, a police academy that, uh, again, trains uh, law enforcement people um, to, to, to help promote harm reduction um, it's, it's a long effort. Um, thank Mich you for Michelle, your Michelle, in the commission report, there's a number in there in terms of tallying up what the price tag would be for programmatically yeah. making a, a higher level of investment. I think it was $3.2 billion. Yeah. But we're saying the money is there. We, we're saying we need, no money. We, we need we're saying reallocate money from silly, right. ineffective interventions in law enforcement into useful. Let's take another question or two here. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Ms. Ivy. I'm an intern at Futures Group. And these are kind of general questions. Um, but I know that, Michelle, you mentioned that you wanted to give control back to the governments. Um, but in countries that are known to have like, corrupt government systems, what measures will you take to kind of ensure or at least monitor transparency and accountability and also like proper resource allocation? And also on a personal note with drug users, um, do you think that rehab services will be enough you know, when there's other barriers, such as um, structural, societal, and, and economic determinants um, that really affect individuals on our, you know, here in the US and in developing countries? Thank you. Do we have any other questions? We'll come back. Yes? I'm uh, Evan Novalis of IMA World Health. And I just wanted to ask, um, what are some of the difficulties you've had um, reaching out to people or looking at public opinion? Is it um, the certain, certain types of drugs or is it uh, the sort of difference between criminal behavior and, and, or seeing it as a health problem? Thank you. Okay, I'm just start okay. On this. Uh, okay so I've, I've for, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the, the first part of your question. The second was about rehab, yeah. Yeah. They're known to be corrupt. Like, how can you ensure that they'll, you know, they'll monitor their practices and they'll have good transparency and proper resource allocation towards the plans, you know, to reduce drugs and moving forward? Yeah, thank you for that question. Actually, someone asked a very similar question uh, uh, in, in New York in one of our meetings about, okay, you're, you're, uh, you want to put control back into governments, but then if the governments are infiltrated and corrupt themselves, then there's a vicious circle. Um, I think the answer is what you said yourself is, um, well, first, I, I would say, uh, of course, the risk is there. Uh, but second, the answer is transparency and accountability, two, two words that you have been using. Uh, and I personally believe whatever area of government you talk about, um, it is transparency and public accountability that, that will help. Uh, I do not believe in any reform action or whatever uh, that the government would take and say it implements if it isn't transparent about it and if it doesn't allow for public accountability. So uh, I think your point is well taken. Let's hope that the more transparency there is, uh, the better the system will work. Uh, but we're not, uh, you know, uh, but, but the risk you're, you're pointing out to is, 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 is real. Um, on rehab, let me just uh, uh, quickly say that, um, and, and here it's more of a personal opinion, uh, so um, we, we, and, and more of a European message. Um, of course, if people can quit drugs, fine. If people cannot quit drugs, uh, we, we have substitutive therapy that really reduces the harm. To, uh, to me, the primary philosophy is, is not aiming necessarily at quitting drugs. It's at reducing the harms and having the people and the community be healthy and live the, the, the best life they, they can live. And actually, there is interesting evidence in the literature 
that if you're on the methadone program for years, you have more chances to one day quit uh, drugs than if you're not on the substitution therapy. But let's, let's not have uh, the objective of quitting drugs through rehab as the number one objective of, 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 of treatment. Now on the other point, um, so I would say that 90% of politicians I've spoken to individually agree with the commission. Um, uh, I would say you know, maybe 90% of policemen agree, 90% of businessmen agree. Um, uh, the 10% uh, the that don't agree, if you actually say to them, um, uh, you know, if you have uh, a child who has a drug problem, would you rather they went to prison or, mm. um, or be, be sent to a drug rehabilitation center, they quite quickly start agreeing as well um, because they don't want their children sent off to prison or, or, or if it's their brothers or sisters if they have a problem, do you, do you want them sent? So, um, so I think the, uh, you know, so I think the overwhelming number of people individually agree with the commission. Uh, and, and then it's a political thing. It's, it's do, do they think they're gonna get reelected if they, if, you know, if they put their head above the parapet? Um, and, uh, and then, um, you know, and then the numbers drop off um, quite dramatically. Um, and, uh, and I think um, what, what, we, we, what we have the commission have to do is try to help them politically, you know, come up with wording that they can sort of sell to the public. Um, if you talk about legalization, you know, that's, you know, that, 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 that's, a, difficult that, that's a difficult one. If you talk about treating drugs as a health problem, you know, it's a much, a much easier one. Um, and you know, so presentation, presenta presentation is critical. I mean, you know, do you, do you want your do you want your brothers and sisters to be sent to prison if they have a problem, an alcohol problem? No, you know, I mean, so it's just it's how it's presented, and, and, and that's what, that's one of the things we're trying to do is to help work with politicians to get them to be able to present it better. Thank you. We've gotten to the close here. Um, I want to offer just a few remarks. First of all, I should have said at the outset, outset I had watched the TEDx video from the Ironwood prison visit, and that was very touching, I felt. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, and innovative, um, the voices of those prisoners were very moving, and, and, um, and, and congratulations on that. Um, I think we've heard a lot of very positive things today. We've heard about the an appeal, there's a certain hope and optimism and momentum, a sense of momentum around uh, making the case for flexibility and for pragmatism and for experimentation across decriminalization, regulation, uh, deregulation and strategic, you know, strategic focus to, to, to uh, the drug war and, uh, and for an, a, a different kind of dialogue. And uh, I just want to thank you and congratulate you on having really been so instrumental, both of you Thank and the you. other commissioners, in pushing this dialogue forward. And I, I wish you the best. And I hope we can reconvene at the next correct inflection point uh, to hear about the commission's work and to hear about the broader debate. So please join me in congratulating. Thank you.